Hi and welcome to this week's episode of Off the Hill, the ANU's weekly look at what's been happening inside the 2016 federal election campaign. As always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, constitutional law expert Ryan Goss and political marketing expert Andrew Hughes. And as always, if you're in, if you're in Canberra on Tuesday night, get along and you can see us this week with, with John Hewson and Bob McMullen talking about the final issues of the campaign and probably giving some really well, uh, really badly thought out predictions. Okay, let's get started for this week. And Ryan, I know you've got some uh, thoughts on this week of election launches, of campaign launches. Yeah, that's right, Jill. So um, coming up this uh, this weekend, we have uh, Malcolm Turnbull and the Liberal Party launching their campaign. And yep. of course, last Sunday, we saw Bill Shorten launching his campaign. And this is a good thing. Campaign in a sea of red, you know, <laughs> in Sydney, rather. Um, look, I think these campaign launches really underline um, one of the farcical aspects of this campaign, <laughs> which is that we are days out from the election now, and we still don't have the party's um, policy platforms There's from, nothing, either, right? from either side. Um, if the policy launches are not a day on which to launch your policy, then what are they, what are they for? And voters deserve mm. better. We've already had literally hundreds of thousands of people casting their votes before mm. the full mm. set of policies are out. If you want to have a launch and have a fancy party, that's fine. But the policies should be out at the start of the campaign in full, ready for <coughs> voters to <coughs> scrutinise. And I think we've touched on this previously, right? Other countries do this. Exactly. And there's no reason we can't do it. It's something that's done in, in many other countries. In the UK, for example, at the start of the campaign, the full set of policies comes out and then people have an argument over whether or not those policies are good. Instead of having an argument about, oh, when will this policy be released or when will these costings be released? People out there, voters, need to know what the parties stand for early on so that they can tease it out and scrutinise it and mm. argue about it. We haven't even really talked about costings in this campaign. Usually no, that's no. the one the one good old reliable, <laughs> right, that we can fight about costings. But we know what the campaign launches are for this time, and it's just to pivot public attention. That's right. It's, it's, a, it's a great publicity occasion. I'm sure, um, I'm sure this is something that... that um, <laughs> Mr. Publicity. Oh, what a title. Yeah. <laughs> no. I feel honoured. <laughs> no substance or flash. <laughs> that's all right. All spin, no substance. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Andrew. What are your thoughts on it? Oh, look, campaign launches. Don't you love them? I no. see red. I think this is what Andrew just said. The, we don't the love them. waving behind, you know, Bill Shorten every time he got up with 100 positive policies. Look, the, it, Questacon, the, the whole point here about the this... The yeah. admission fees. Oh, oh, huge issue in the campaign. <laughs> How could you, Jill, not overlook that... Oh. I should get up and leave right now. <laughs> you haven't talked about that. Either. But this is textbook marketing, right? It is. It is textbook marketing. That's for sure. Because it's all about making sure you don't overpromise and underdeliver while in government. Because Labor has a big lesson there from Kevin Rudd. He did exactly that. Let's not forget he came in with a huge, you know, popular support, huge mm. news poll ratings. Twelve months later, he was on the slide. I mean, twelve months later, he was getting towards the point where people were already talking about leadership change. Which is what happened. There were other things going on with Rudd, though. Exactly right. But the Obama did the same thing, too. Obama, first time up, was hope. Second time up was not about hope. It was mm. about progression. That's so, true. And this is the same thing with Labor. Like, trying to go a lot less on the actual specific details means that you can't be done for it later on if you get elected. Or, mm. you know, heaven forbid, if you go into the post-election period where people might rake over the coals a bit more, you can't be then picked on for, hey, you came up with this idea. What made you think that? So in a way, it's a, it's a good marketing tactic because it's all about the gloss. It really is. We won't have it's another greatest moral challenge of our time, will we? That's right. Yeah, we won't. It's all about image management nowadays. So the bigger debate is how you manage your image more than about managing a policy. Now, kind of the problem, my theory on this is that th this is the flip side of compulsory voting. And I'm very yeah. pro-compulsory <clears> voting. <throat> it, it avoids the Trump and, and Corbyn kind of uh, whiplash. What we do get, though, is incredibly dull campaigns. And that has a normative kind of effect, right? I mean, that's it's mm. problematic when voters don't know exactly what they're voting for. To kind of <laughs> prove my point, I think this this week's focus on Medicare yeah. uh, kind of elucidates that, that the ALP hasn't said anything specific about Medicare. They've no. just said, hey, guys, Medicare, uh, remember health. Yep. And the reason they do that is because, I mean, voters love health. ALP voters particularly love health. 25% of, of ALP identifiers, so people who not necessarily voted for the ALP but say that they are ALP lifelong voters, uh, rated health or Medicare as the most important issue in the 2013 election. And among those, 70% thought that the ALP had the closest policy to their own view. Among liberal identifiers, 8% still mm. thought that the, liberal, that the ALP had the closest policy to their own position. So yeah. it's 8% of coalition voters that you can swing if they're thinking about Medicare. It's yeah. cynical, 
but it works, right? Exactly right. Yeah. And exactly why <coughs> uh, Medicare is such a strong issue for Labor too, is because it's a reminder of why you vote for Labor. Yep. But also it's, it's a tangible issue which everyone can relate to because health is so important to everyone out there. Uh, mm. And it plays well for Labor for that reason. It's, it's a localization of your message. Yep. So hard in politics when you're doing a mass communications campaign like this is to make that message hit home in a point which changes your behavior at an individual level. That 8% need to be motivated emotionally to change their behavior. Yep. This is how you do it. And health is what does it. And I think we've seen um, newspaper <coughs> headlines this week accusing Labor of running a scare campaign. Mm. We saw um, a very um, a lengthy interview with Lee Sales and Bill Shorten on Thursday night about whether or not this was a scare campaign. Yeah. And I think um, whether or not Labor's claims about what the coalition will do to Medicare is a scare campaign, mm. I think what this reflects to me is one of the difficulties that Malcolm Turnbull is in in this campaign. Voters know that in the first Abbott hockey budget, the yep. coalition was willing to um, mess around with Medicare and mess around with the GP, with their GP. Mm. And Malcolm Turnbull is in a very tricky spot here, similar to what Julia Gillard was in 2010. He both wants to stand on his government and his party's record, but also distance himself from Tony Abbott. So um, I think in that sense, it's, it's a tricky one for Malcolm Turnbull to find mm. his way out of, even if it is, um, as some have alleged, a scare campaign of sorts. Yeah. The coalition could not talk about health. And, no. that, and that's sort of bottom line. Yeah. Now on Tuesday night, uh, on sort of hopefully a bit more substantial issues, uh, on Tuesday night the ANU hosted the annual Lionel Murphy Memorial Lecture and Penny Wong gave a really lovely, I think, speech about uh, marriage equality. Yeah, a lovely speech, but I think also a very um, hard-hitting one in, in yeah, some ways. Yeah, an important one, yeah. An important one. Um, and it's an issue that we, um, we haven't seen a lot of in the campaign mm in most of the country, but I think mm. we're seeing it being discussed in a smaller number of seats and in certain demographics. It must be yeah. popping up in Batman and Grainler and Melbourne, yeah. surely. In, in, in a number of seats, and I think particularly for a younger demographic as well, yep. it, may be, it may be more important. But look, what we, why this is interesting to me is, yes, it's interesting as an election issue, but it's really, I think, gonna shape the dynamics of whoever wins yeah. after the election. For what the do you think will happen? Year. So if Labor wins the election, they have said that they'll legislate for marriage equality within 100 days. So we could see um, same-sex marriages happening um, legally in Australia um, in the not too distant future. Would that be a binding vote on ALP members? Um, at this stage, the vote would be, I can't remember the position of the Labour <laughs> Party at this stage, in this parliament, my understanding is that it would be. I think um, they hadn't. And that it wasn't mm, in the- Nailed um, it down. And, yep. um, but there will be a vote in, the, in this term. Yep. Um, and that that will go through with a mandate if Labour wins. But I think the more interesting thing is if the coalition um, wins, they've said that they'll have a plebiscite, a nationwide vote. None of the details of how that will work are clear. They're not yeah. set down anywhere. There'll need to be a debate quickly about what form that plebiscite takes. Is it compulsory voting? Is it postal voting? What form is the question? If it, if it succeeds, will it automatically get up? None of this is clear, and that will very quickly become a source of division within the coalition, but also mm. potentially within the other political parties. It's a train wreck. It's potentially a, a, a train wreck, even on that side, and Penny Wong highlighted a number yeah. of reasons why um, mm. Gay and lesbian Australians should be concerned about that, as well as the rest of Australians about the the divisiveness and the uh, anger that might be raised. It by will it. open up all all sorts of horrible cleavages, I think. Yeah, and I think that's the danger too on this issue. Mm. Yeah, um, and and looking even beyond into the future too, um, if Malcolm Turnbull's got to go back to some of the, his uh, policies he holds dear to his heart, like climate change and Republic, for example, and, and mm. the Indigenous recognition. Now that Bill Sean's talking about a treaty, yep. that's another issue which so is going to have to be discussed. They're going to have to face that. Yep. They are going to have to face it. And these issues, you know what, we put them on the back burner for way too long as a nation. And it's about time we now you know, have to tackle them. And but there's never any imperative to talk about them. Yeah, exactly Neither party right. wants to talk about I them know. coming into an election. Yeah. When you have that first year, there's been, other, there's been leadership problems, right? That yeah. That have prevented yeah. these issues from being sorted. So, look, fingers crossed, I guess, after this election, there'll be some clear air. Yeah. Um, because we it know they're be. not going to be discussed before an election. No, they just now. turn voters off, which is you know, I, who's to judge? Yeah, and I think it, it gets in that that theme of you know a lot of negativity at the moment in politics as well. And it's a long campaign; people are a little bit tired at the moment of politics. People are tired. Yeah, people are very and, tired. And if anything will make them more tired, it's a plebiscite. There is absolutely exactly no right. need for this yep. vote. Parliament can legislate for it. You know, in the click of a finger. There's absolutely no need yep. to have this nationwide vote. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it was absolutely a handball off to a future time that is going to come back to, to really bite, I think. Now, yep. final thoughts for the week. Final thoughts for the week. Um, negative scare campaign, I don't think it's gonna happen for the coalition. I'm gonna go for the fact that um, next week, I think if anything, coalition go very quiet because they don't wanna give any edge at all to Labor 
in the week ahead. I think we'll see a very quiet, positive campaign to end, round off for the coalition. Mm. And Ryan, in your final thought for, for the campaign, because you'll be sunning yourself I'll on be, a well-deserved holiday next week. I'll be in glorious Queensland next week. But, um, <laughs> Stop but it. my final thought is that as we're filming this, the results of the Brexit referendum are still coming in. It's still too close to call. It could well have a major effect on Australian politics in the next week and the next six months. Uh, I think, well, yeah, yeah, you're probably right, which is a shame because <laughs> I don't think much will change either way. <laughs> I think um, my note's kind of dire that I think we wouldn't see an election this boring anywhere. And I'm, I'm a ardent supporter of compulsory voting yep. tell all my in, you know international colleagues you're mad why why don't you mandate voting um maybe their answer is because you get campaigns like this yeah exactly so, right. so maybe i need to <laughs> take a long hard look at myself in some respect <laughs> don't be so hard on yourself jill <laughs> as always thanks for watching and if you're in canberra remember to pop along and see us at the crawford school on tuesday <laughs> we'll see you all next week